Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, this morning's Zurich Financial Visitors uh, Lecture Series. Um, the Zurich Financial uh, Services Distinguished Visitors Program allows the Bren School to host international leaders in environmental policy, law, business, and science to enrich the intellectual life here at the Bren School and to focus uh, and share insights on issues critical to climate change. Uh, it really exemplifies the, the best of what we have at the Brent School. Visitors come, they give a public lecture, they teach our students, and they en engage with the broader Brent community over the course of a week to several months. So on behalf of the Brent School, I want to thank uh, our sponsors uh, and, and for continuing to support this program. We are very honored today to have Dr. Dan Dudak, who is Vice President at Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, in my mind, Dan is one of the most innovative, successful, and radical environmentalists out there. Um, in over 40 years of work at EDF, Dan, I think, has done more than anyone else to lift the ideas of market-based environmental problem solving out of the textbook and into the real world. Uh, I don't think you can find a single major uh, environmental market in the world that doesn't have Dan's handprints on it. So let me just give you a few highlights, and there are just, just a few. Um, as part of the U.S. Uh, delegation to the Montreal Protocol, Dan was responsible for introducing a proto kind of emissions trading program for, emissions, for ozone depleting substances uh, in the 80s. In the 90s, Dan uh, was one of the key architects behind the U.S. Acid Rain Program, which is arguably the most important and most successful uh, environmental market to date. He was also involved in the mid-2000s uh, as a member of the governor-appointed market advisory committee for California's AB32, helping to set up essentially what we know now as California's cap and trade program. Um, and over the last two decades, Dan has been flying to China on a, almost a monthly basis uh, to set up uh, emissions trading in China, both for acid rain, SO2, and for greenhouse gases. And a lot of that work has culminated in what we now know as the beginning of China's national greenhouse gas program. And for, so, and for that work, Dan was uh, awarded the friendship, the National Friendship Award, which is China's highest honor for foreigners. And in fact, the, uh, Dan is the first environmentalist who have received that award. So the list goes on and on and on. Um, in my mind, what's most impressive about Dan's work is that he goes after big problems, and he's not afraid to do the really hard work. That is, he spends up to decades sometimes in certain places trying to build the institutions, trying to understand different cultural contexts to try to understand how to solve these environmental problems. So we're very lucky to have Dan here today, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Meng. Um, I want to thank the Brent School for the opportunity to be here. Uh, you are all have a phenomenally beautiful place to be able to work and play and think great thoughts. It's just spectacular. I can't imagine a more lovely setting. Um, to the extent that I've had uh, success in my work, it's exemplified by people like Professor Meng. He's the one who's going to have to carry the baton here and go forward. And that's why I think the work of the Bren School is so important. Every, as, as Kyle mentioned, all of my work can be measured in decadal chunks. We need the commitment of the younger generations, the folks that are coming up now, to really be able to tackle and address these problems. I also want to thank Professor Chris Costello, who sits on our Board of Trustees for his support of the work at Environmental Defense Fund. Today I want to talk about, or this morning, talk about uh, roughly some, over the last 30 years, some critical policy innovations in their uh, diffusion around the world. But first I want to talk about the Environmental Defense Fund because it's central to this story. Um, EDF was founded about 50 years ago, by some scientists who were concerned about the disappearance of the osprey. Uh, only one-seventh of the chicks that were uh, in eggs actually hatched. Of course, this was at the time when 
Rachel Carson's seminal book, Silent Spring, was published. That was in 1968. Um, um, EDF was founded in, um, uh, excuse me, Rachel Carson was in 62. EDF was founded in uh, 67. Um, and it was by a group of scientists working on Long Island who traced this uh, reproductive problem back to a uh, spring of DDT in the area. And of course, that they did their work, published, nothing happened. So what'd they do? Well, they got a lawyer, right? So this is, you know, the first basic equation in terms of active environmentalism, which was the combination of um, science and law. When we get to the, when we get to the 80s though, um, EDF added economics to the mix. We had hired a new executive director, Fred Krupp, who's still our current uh, president of the organization. That work with economics began here in California with a focus on water. As you know, that's an ongoing challenge. We continue to do that work. Water markets are still a dream for California um, more than 30 years later. That work went east um, in terms of a focus on um, air pollution. We're an organization who is focused in these four main areas. We try to tackle problems of the global commons, which I think arguably are the most difficult um, to solve. Uh, we use teams, interdisciplinary teams of scientists, um, lawyers, uh, and economists. We have offices around the world. When I joined, there were about uh, 30 staff. We had a budget of about $3 million. We're now at 650 and growing. In fact, I think we have a, one of your uh, PhD candidates who's going to be joining our San Francisco office. Hi, Andrew. Hi. So 651. <laughs> our, our, um, we have membership base because we're a membership organization which has more than 2 million people. And our budget this year is, has uh, cracked um, 200 million. Uh, I'm a founder of our uh, work in office in um, China, in Beijing, and more recently, um, I've been leading our work in uh, India. So that's an idea about where our offices are. Let me give you a sense of where my office is. It's that little yellow cross up in the top there. A small town called uh, Potsdam, New York. It's uh, in proximity to the Adirondack Park. The Adirondack Park was created in 1892 by the state of New York. It's about 20% of the state. Uh, it's nearly three times the size of Yellowstone. It is one of only two land areas in the world that are constitutionally protected to change the land use in Adirondack Park requires a change of the Constitution in New York State. Um, it's a public-private uh, arrangement. About 45% of the park is uh, publicly owned in Forest Preserve, uh, dedicated to be forever wild in the Constitution. Uh, there are about um, 130,000 permanent and 200,000 se seasonal residents, over um, uh, 10 million people a year visit the park. And this is why they come. It's an absolutely stunning um, piece of uh, nature. I mean, this is a, this is a picture of uh, uh, some of the, it's dominated by lakes, old eroded mountains, nothing like the great vistas that you have here um, out in the west. Um, but it's ha but it's, one of its virtues is the proximity to that large eastern population. So it gives people a real opportunity and chance to uh, get out and experience nature, particularly in its wild, you know, wildest and undeveloped form. The, in the Adirondacks uh, have the headwaters of the Hudson River. They weren't discovered until after we found the headwaters of the Columbia. That's how wild this area is. In the 80s, I found myself in, you know, back from California, in, uh, in the east, and I was introduced to the problems of uh, acid rain, high levels of acidic precipitation, impermeable bedrock, and uh, relatively high elevations created 
lots of forest damage. We had um, from the acid uh, leaching of aluminum out of the soils and you know some of the articles uh, in the New York Times had headlines like acid rain in Adirondacks disrupts the chain of life, acid rain imperils Adirondacks fish, etc. So the Adirondacks were the poster child for acid rain for about 20 years. Um, also in this time, uh, the science was hotly debated about acid rain. Does that sound familiar? Have any resonance with some of what's going on today? Um, at, yet at the same time, as this child's drawing illustrates, there was a fairly widespread understanding about the actual uh, mechanics underlying about it. The real challenge was the political mystery of what to do about the problem. That was the real, uh, the real issue here. And of course, the, what happened was um, with the passage of the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments, there was a new set of requirements for uh, national ambient air quality standards, particularly on um, criteria pollutants like sulfur dioxide. And the decision was made uh, to basically allow people to build tall stacks, 400 to 600 feet in the air. And of course, what lofting those emissions higher meant that we had no problem locally with respect to meeting the NACs, but they traveled enormous distances. And this shows a kind of um, stylized pattern of the atmospheric flows uh, throughout the region. So you solved one problem on the back of creating another. Um, and what we have then is part of the, by now, well-known formula of the northeastern states combining together in something called the North, Northeast States for coordination on uh, air. And uh, it launched a protracted set of legal battles which actually continue to today in terms of litigation between downwind states and the upwind um, emitters. In terms of strategies uh, beyond tall stacks, there were two basic approaches here. One's a technology-based um, post-combustion control, flue gas desulfurization. Many think of it as expensive, but it gets high rates of removal, 90 to 95% SO2 removal. The big thing that I saw about this that I thought was a problem, there's a 10% energy penalty associated with running this, which means that, okay, once again, you might solve an SO2 problem, but boy, you're gonna pump up CO2 in relation to um, getting after this stuff. The alternative in terms of an approach uh, is low sulfur coal. So yes, back then there was a war on coal. It was a war on high sulfur coal. And we were either gonna keep those high sulfur unionized coal mining jobs by using flue gas desulfurization, or we're going to go to low sulfur coal in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. This is a picture taken from the uh, International Space Station in December of 2015. And if you look right here, it's an example of the size and scale of the mining in the Powder River Basin. It's just extraordinary. Um, so we were, and gas also started, natural gas started becoming the running at this time as merchant power plants and competition on generation started. So we were stuck in a, in this, political battle between unionized high sulfur coal, uh, concentrated emissions in the old industrialized Midwest, downstream, um, downwind uh, da damaged states, including our friends in Canada who were really unhappy about us throwing our garbage over the border, and uh, what to do about the problem. Uh, so EDF, in thinking about the 1988 presidential election decided the hubris of a small environmental organization to write a set of recommendations for whoever would win the election. It was called Project 88. It was a bipartisan report. It was co-sponsored by Senator Tim Worth, Democrat Colorado, and uh, John Hines, Republican Pennsylvania. Uh, and two of the recommendations in this report were use a market to tackle acid rain. I didn't write that one but I did write the one that says, create a greenhouse gas market. So those were the two things that we had for them. Tom Tietenberg is the one who wrote the acid rain um, component. Bush one, 
invited us in, said, OK, it's a great idea. Bush had made a promise he wanted to be the environmental president. Nobody believed him. And he was asking a whole range of people about, OK, what should I do to make good on that claim? We said, solve the acid rain problem. It's you know, the biggest single environmental challenge you know, facing the country. It's a battle, a protracted battle. It's been going on for you know, 20 years. So I'm not, this is, a, again, well-known example, cap and trade. You take the, uh, the uh, rigidity of the cap, combine it with the flexibility of a market mechanism which allows people to comply any way they want, including uh, by trading, cooperating with others. This is a, gives you an idea of the range of the program. You know, more than, more than 2,000 sources. The purple dots are those in the first phase. The um, orange are those in the second phase of the program. Um, again, I think the innovation here is this is the first time there's an actual solution to transboundary problems. Something that creates, in the sense of a national market, a way in which you can do something other than litigating against another state, against another party. Um, and that's one of the problems that we wrestle with in relation to climate change, uh, for sure. I'm sure you've all followed a lot of the issues there. Um, a key innovation also with this program, this is the first time that continuous emissions monitoring systems were used. We know in real time everything that's going up the stack. That, that was absolutely key to the trading program because we could, with confidence, say to the public, we know what's going on. We can allow people the freedom to make decisions about how to control. This is now the sine qua non of measurement in relation to um, at least atmospheric emissions. Uh, we also, which is also a little known fact, in these amendments, in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, got written in a requirement for all utilities to report their CO2 emissions beginning in 1995. So we have the longest individual record of actual uh, emissions from the uh, power sector. Another really key in, uh, set of innovations here. You know, it's one thing to be an economist and say, oh, you know, let the market go, let them all figure it out. But the bookend to that is rigorous compliance and enforcement. And the system is elegantly simple. It's like a checkbook, right? You deposit allowable emissions, the emissions are withdrawals, and the compliance check is, are you have a positive balance or zero, just like we do with our banks. And so it's a simple test. Automatic penalty levied. There's no possibility of you know, uh, litigation or discussion. You can litigate if you want, but that's after you pay the penalty. The penalty was first set as um, $2,000 a ton. But another innovation here is we said, hey, look, you know, this is a long-term program. What's going to happen is inflation is just going to reduce the impact of the penalty. So we put an inflation escalator in it. And it started at 2,000 a ton. In 2018 terms, it's 4,000 a ton. The other innovation here, which I'm sad to say has not been followed by many other environmental programs, is that if there's an exceedance, you have to pay the environment back. You have to do an extra reduction. And basically, that's done by deducting from the next year's allocation. So I think that's, like I said, I would like to see more of that, more of that happen. Banking was another innovation. The conventional wisdom at this time was that no source will ever produce a reduction sooner than it was absolutely required to or compelled to by law or regulation. And we said, no, that's not true. <laughs> In fact, we did some modeling with uh, EPA's own uh, house modeling operation, which was uh, ICF resources, to show, in fact, that you know, uh, given the nature of the program, companies would take advantage of the economies of scale associated with emission reductions and investment. You know, this is not getting SO2 re reductions. It's not like going to the thermostat and dialing in the temperature. These are big plants big investments and big reductions. And I think one of the important things about that was we got control much sooner than we would have otherwise had to. The bank topped out at one point in time at about uh, 
11.7 million tons. And I think one of the lessons now, one of the questions I would ask now is how can we incentivize companies to do more sooner, now? One of the other things that happened out of this program is, um, and you, you, many of you might find this funny, but it's an argument that I still hear now. And that's in relation to the fact that people have a hard time imagining that s with, with respect to sulfur dioxide and the argument being made now with respect to carbon dioxide, that somehow there's an iron linkage between these emissions and economic growth, that we're not going to be able to grow if we control these emissions. And in fact, for the first time, what we saw, again, was the decoupling of GDP and SO2. And I think that same decoupling can be uh, demonstrated as well with respect to greenhouse gases. So what happened on the ground? Big change in terms of uh, deposition fairly quickly as a result of the banking and over control. Another thing that happened that is really important and is coming to the fore now with the global burden of disease is the importance of the health benefits associated with reducing these criteria pollutants. Uh, you know, in China, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, 1.6 million people die each year prematurely as a result of exposure to air, air pollution. Benefit cost ratios, when you add in health and respect to the acid rain program, exceed 30 to 1. So the question then becomes, okay, we did this large scale demonstration, but can it be adapted to climate change? Is it going to work here as well? And I, arguably, I'd say the jury is still out. So in terms of thinking about I was responsible for in EDF for not only a lot of this practical work, but also developing strategy in our atmosphere program. And the question arose, well, OK, where are we going to focus? We did this stuff in the United States. And this is, you know, what I did was something very simple. I simply looked at emissions around the world, and because this is a global problem, and said, you know, we are not going to solve this problem unless we get China in. And you know, I had been very much involved in the um, early years of negotiation leading up to the UNFCCC, uh, the Framework Convention in, in Rio. And again, uh, I was at Kyoto. I actually briefed Vice President Gore when he landed uh, in Kyoto to try to break the deadlock. And it's China that we have to get in the program. The US was using China as a shield at that time, saying, we can't do anything. The Chinese will never agree to reduce emissions. Um, so anything we would do would be dwarfed by China. And in a sense, they have, a, you know, they have a powerful argument. You know, China is a colossus. It, it, its economy will eclipse um, the US by you know, most, most forecasts, although its per capita um, is still has it ranking only about 80th um, in the world. Um, it's the world's largest car market. Um, it has, uh, it's a colossus in terms of both coal and clean energy, which is an interesting irony. But it reflects the sense of the priorities that China has developed over time in relation to trying to um, both change the direction of its economy as well as to dominate the low carbon economy of the future. So in 1991, I was invited to go to China by the what then was the National Environmental Protection Administration. Uh, they were starting some experiments on uh, using economic incentives to try to control pollution. They were going to tax emissions, something called the pollution levy system. Um, they got interested in the work that I had been doing in relation to the acid rain program in the US. And they said, would you come and talk to us? We've got a group of uh, provincial leaders that are going to go out and start experimentation with this new policy called the uh, PLS. China's um, urban air pollution problems are, I think, well known um, around the world. They're you know, basically fossil fuel based, but to a significant extent, it's coal. Uh, I think their coal 
production and combustion peaked in 2013 at about four and a quarter billion tons. Uh, in 2017, consumption is estimated about 3.8 by uh, Brookings, so we've seen a downturn. But we still have all these question marks about, is it going to stay down? Is this just a you know, pause? You know, what is ultimately going to happen? It's going to be the world's largest coal consumer, as for, I think, out till something in the range of 2040, according to the EIA. Chinese emissions are also of relevance to us here. Uh, there's a recent publication um, in the Journal of Environmental Management where the authors look at um, and show effects of the Chinese New Year on U.S. air quality. Now, when you think about that, you think, okay, it's got to be the fireworks, right? It's all the stuff that's going on. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the fact that everybody's out, has left home, has traveled to go and be with their family, and it's the shutdown of the factories in China during this, during this period. Um, they also documented that with respect to sandstorms. So we have a vested interest, particularly you here on the West Coast have a vested interest in what happens in China and air quality. So this is a, um, a Xerox copy of a hand-colored map that was submitted to the State Council in 1994. The State Council is equivalent to China's cabinet. It was in support of um, a proposal at that time, which was called Total Emissions Control. Uh, as an environmentalist, you've got to love that name. It's just fantastic. It's like nothing escapes, right? Uh, and China did the hard thing first. You know, they, in 1995, they set a cap on SO2. They had no idea about how to get there. We spent 20 years talking about how to get there and then finally settled on making a commitment to, to do it. So the issue then became, what the heck is total emissions control? So I had an academic partner at uh, Renmin University at this time. And what we did is we ran around to all the different agencies that we thought might have a stake or a role in this policy and said, what do you think TEC is? What are you going to do about TEC? And we found that people were either scratching their heads or reading from the ninth five-year plan. Uh, so we decided together to write a book. And the book we wrote was the first book on emissions trading in China. And we said, this is what TEC is. It's a cap. Combine it with trading. And you know what? You got a great policy tool. So this was done in 1999. China, um, somewhat like the United States, uses its provinces as laboratories for experimentation. I don't think there's a major policy that you can identify that China has committed to that it has not experimented first at the local, at the local level. And recognizing this, I said, and China's got different governance models. Right? So this is a picture of Benxi iron and steel um, that I took. Benxi is in. Uh, Liaoning, uh, the old industrialized Manchuria, it's sort of like our Midwest in uh, uh, a number of respects. And Benxi was known as the invisible city because it couldn't be seen from the air because the emissions were so bad. It's the first place I ever saw black snow and ice. It's just an extraordinary place. So we were looking at different governance systems. Benxi had the capacity to pass, had a local congress, had the capacity to pass a local law. And then we also went um, down the coast to Jiangsu province, which is one of the more uh, advanced, economically advanced um, parts of China, um, and the city of Nantong. And what we wanted to test was the plasticity of administrative regulation. And we found a very motivated local environmental official at the Nantong Environmental Protection Bureau. Uh, who had a problem on his hands. He took the TEC, that is the cap on SO2, seriously. There was a plant that wanted to expand capacity but hadn't really thought that TEC was a very serious policy. They tried to get variances, et cetera. He said, no, no variances. So we arranged a, uh, a transaction with a local power plant who 
uh, substituted low sulfur coal. And that was the first um, um, emission trade in China. In uh, 2002, uh, you know, I had been doing all this local work, trying to keep the central government apprised of what that work is. And at that time, the administrator of the State Environmental Protection um, Administration was a man by the name of Xi Jinping. Some of you may know that name if you followed climate at all. Um, so in 2002, I had the opportunity to give him the first personal briefing on emission trading, what it is, how it works, et cetera. Um, and three months later, he launched, he, uh, you know, in an agreement with EDF, we established a uh, partnership called 4 plus 3 plus 1 um, to test out SO2 emissions trading on a broad scale uh, in China. This is a, uh, an area which covered a thir one third of China's SO2 emissions. And what we did is we gave them a, we said, okay, we want you to experiment with this. We're gonna give you, the requirements are that you have to have a cap, you have to have an SO2 permit, monitoring, uh, allocation, and you can include emissions trading if you want. So we gave them a framework to implement and said, go to it. Um, the results of that experimentation were captured in this book. You know, at the time, uh, we were enthusiastic about his publication, so we committed to an enormous run of these books. And of course, there, there was little interest. So the, they all were put in cardboard boxes and went off to a warehouse. Unbeknownst to me, a number of years later, this would be the most sought after book in China. Because what it was, was it had all of the experiences from the local leaders, the participants in the program. They told their own story about what they did, the problems they had, and how they solved the problems. So what's China's perspective on um, climate change? Um, again, depending on what, at what level you track or follow this problem, um, you know about the G77 plus China. You know that China has often been the bet noir of the climate um, progress in terms of climate negotiations. Uh, but China's own perspective, and this is taken from their national submission, so I will make no claims for the precision of the 27.2, but that's their number, not my, uh, not my statistic. But China basically presents itself as a victim of climate change. It doesn't think it's going to benefit in any way from climate change. And it, the priority problems that it identifies are largely related to food because the Chinese for centuries have been focused on the problem of feeding their population. So in thinking about, okay, how do we get from SO2 to CO2? started thinking about this self-perception, this problem of food, and the issues of the rural sector. China is still, to a significant extent, a rural nation. Um, we have this rural to urban migration that I'm sure you've read about, and there's this huge income disparity between rural areas and the cities, which is what propels the migration. So we thought, okay, if we want to show benefits from controlling greenhouse gases, this is the place to focus. Let's start in the rural sector. And so what we did is we started out with a set of uh, cooperative projects in um, three, different, three different provinces. Um, Xinjiang in the far west, uh, Sichuan in the center there, and then Shanxi. Um, different, different projects, different uh, strategies. We, uh, over, we enrolled more than 400,000 farm families in this program, produced over a million tons of reductions, uh, about two million in sales from those reductions, plus an additional two million from increases in um, on-farm revenue because they were managing things more efficiently, not using as much fertilizer, um, etc. We had coupled, we coupled that with uh, key partners. And the partners were not only important in terms of developing the pilots, but they were also a delivery vehicle to the higher authorities. So 
the State Council's Poverty Alleviation Office. Again, remember, State Council is their cabinet. All right? The um, China's Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, we set up a center for research on agriculture and climate change. CCICED may not be a very well-known organization to you. It's the um, uh, China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. Um, I served for um, 10 years as a council member. It's 40 members, 20 Chinese, 20 foreign. Um, I, I, in some sense, I was the anomaly uh, because of my profile. A lot of the people that sit on there are former uh, environment ministers from European and other countries, you know, very high profile individuals. Um, the beauty of the CCICED is it meets every year personally with the premier to deliver its results in terms of the work. So I had uh, in my tenure there, I uh, co-chaired uh, five task forces, one of which was focused on this issue about uh, greenhouse gases, uh, poverty alleviation, and um, uh, how that can be how that can be tapped and address the, some of the priorities of the country. Again, a couple of the covers of a few of the books that we uh, developed as products out of this. Uh, and just to give you an idea about some of the potential here, uh, we did some, you know, in all of our work, we tried to do a analysis and some modeling. And this looked at county level data in terms of fertilizer use combined with soils information to try to assess what is the potential for uh, precision fertilizer in China. Turns out to be about 300 million tons a year in terms of CO2E, which is a non-trivial um, amount of reduction. We also thought very seriously about things like market infrastructure. Uh, so we did, and Professor Meng was involved in this adventure um, in a former life. This is China's first environmental exchange, the China-Beijing Environmental Exchange. Create not only a trading platform, but a registry. You know, we needed something to be able, a repository to be able to hold these things and track them. This was done around the time of the Beijing Olympics, and uh, like a lot of organizations, we're interested in trying to influence environmental outcomes during the Olympics, and we had uh, about 400,000 tons of CO2e transacted through CBEX um, in the period of the um, in the period of the Olympics. A lot of them were people who had signed up voluntarily for so-called a green commuting program that we had, uh, where people could buy a little transponder to go in the subway, and along with it, there would be a ton of CO2 and a website that could find out where their ton came from. So it was a way of, again, engaging the public and getting people to understand. So on the right-hand side is growth and fuel use over time, projections, these are from BP. Left-hand side is uh, forecasts in, in terms of use. We did, we've also created something called the China Energy Modeling Farm, where we've tried to say, okay, these are forecasts based on you know, different assumptions, et cetera. Let's try to put China's premier energy modeling teams together and try to see if we can't get some convergence and understanding about what's, what's possible. And out of that work, we found that it's both technically and economically feasible to peak in, in China and peak before 20, 2030. The question was how to do it. So these are the pieces of the equation. Carbon caps, I think, are, you know, again, fundamental, energy efficiency, demand side management, and of course, um, uh, clean energy. You've seen what kind of a uh, footprint China has in this regard. So then we also, um, by this time, this is 2009, um, Xi Jinping is China's lead negotiator on climate. Um, there's a whole long backstory associated with that, but suffice it to say, people thought they were giving him an ugly job uh, in China, which he managed to turn into um, a spectacular uh, success. He was also the vice chair now of the National Development and Reform Commission, arguably the most powerful uh, economic and planning agency in China. And we, he launched a set of carbon trading pilots. Basically said to all these provinces, hey, I'm NDRC. I want you to come voluntarily, step forward, and say who wants to 
party and who wants to volunteer um, to create a carbon trading demonstration. Uh, we had uh, MOUs with Shenzhen, um, launch number one, and Hubei, the biggest of the, um, of the three. Uh, we also had an agreement with NDRC to do joint training, bring all the seven pilots together, share experiences, um, solutions to problems, etc. And then, and then, in September of 2015, something just unimaginable happened. We have the Chinese president standing next to the American president, the Chinese president saying, you know what? China can do it. We're going to do a national carbon trading program. And of course, this is after the massive failures in the United States to adopt Waxman-Markey, which would have been our national greenhouse gas uh, trading program. It's just phenomenal. Also, Xi Jinping's commitments at this time, um, Secretary of State, then Secretary of State, John Kerry said, without China and its commitments to rounding folks up together with the United States, there would have been no Paris Agreement. So this was a, again, a real uh, turning point. Here's a, a China's set of uh, commitments that it's made in terms of uh, Paris. One of the things you find um, uh, is China has a wide, has a strategy and an approach of throwing a lot of different things up against the wall to see what sticks. But in my experience, I think the peaking commitment was made possible by two things. One was the modeling work, and the second was the experience in terms of the uh, carbon pilots. Then, in December, December 18th, China did its launch of its national carbon trading program that, was, uh, that um, Xi Jinping um, committed to. What does it look like? It's a three-phase program. Um, you know, there been, there's lots of expectations about this. It's going to be primarily focused on the power sector. But nonetheless, even though it's just the power sector, that'll be three and a half billion tons of carbon, of carbon dioxide. It will be more than 1,600 sources. It's roughly 40% of China's total emissions. And it'll be the largest emissions trading system in the world, by far. Um, there's a, a monitoring, reporting, and verification process, which will continue in the other seven targeted sectors. Uh, that's over 7,000 companies and over 5 billion uh, tons of carbon dioxide. I think the likely phase two um, expansion will be in aluminum, cement, and aviation. So one of the challenges that China has, I mentioned this briefly before, is policy coordination. You know, chi China is a country that's so diverse. I mean, we have diversity here between, you know, California and Indiana, for example, um, if nothing else other than in mentality of the politicians they produce. Um, but there's real diversity. You know, if you look at the, you know, the glittering, glamorous east coast of, of China, if you've ever been there, you could be any place in the developed world. Just don't pay attention to the, you know, the characters on the signs. Right? It's just uh, amazing. But then as you progress you know, into the central part of the country, that's where the leading edge of economic development is going. And when you get into the far west, it is incredibly um, undeveloped and um, highly rural. So in the current plans for this area, uh, basically the west is targeted to be a, basically an energy base for the east. So you dial down emissions in the east by closing facilities, but you build things like mine mouth power plants um, in the West, export the power a uh, uh, longer distance. They have things like uh, proposals on, and we have a large scale um, west to east pipeline for natural gas that comes out of not only Xinjiang, but also the Central Asian Republics. And then there are a number of large scale Syngas uh, proposals um, that have been launched. We get to Xi Jinping's personal private initiative called the Belt and Road. Um, this is kind of a schematic, an illustration of it. Uh, 68 nations, two thirds of the global population, 60% of global carbon, a third of global trade and GDP. 
what's its impact of carbon as this thing starts rolling out? It's something, and China starts accelerating its uh, going out and in investment uh, process. This looks at some of China's overseas coal projects that it's funding um, or developing right now. So although China within the country might be doing something, its outward bound investment has a big carbon footprint. And so real, one of the real questions is, can we get China to be advocating more aggressively in terms of its domestic climate policies internationally in terms of the projects that it's um, undertaking? I mentioned that I started work in India. Um, my China story is a compression of 25 years. Uh, given where I am, I'm hoping it goes a little quicker in India. <laughs> and I guess the question now, you know, this tool that began, you know, with the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, there's now more than 90 countries uh, that have mentioned it and said that they would do this in terms of their um, national program. I want to leave you with a question. Are we expecting too much of this tool? So thank you very much for your time today. I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Um, my question is about co-pollutants and the extent to which China's interest in a carbon cap and trade is motivated by the idea that if they reduce carbon emissions, they're also going to be reducing you know, local pollutants. And if, if the answer is you know, a significant amount of their interest in carbon reductions is, is motivated by co-pollutants, then, then my follow-on question is, can we use that argument in other countries as well, for, for example, in India? Um, a great uh, question. Um, and in fact, I think that the one of Xi Jinping's interest, his focus now, you see lots of things in the paper about what he's doing. Um, his interest is in securing the position of the Communist Party in terms of governance in China. And I think he, you know, uh, Chinese are always students of history. And if you look at what happened with the former Soviet Union, a big element that took the former Soviet Union down was the fact that people, particularly in Eastern Europe, recognized that those governments were systematically poisoning and killing their own people. China is in the situation now of 1.6 million people, as I mentioned, dying every year. The government needs to take action. I mean, they've demonstrated they can do it. I was at the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Hey, blue skies. Beijing Olympics disappears. So do the blue skies, right? So they, they've shown that they can do it. They know what the problem is. It's been the challenge of things like, again, this you know, fragmented institutions in terms of who has responsibility. And that also fits in with Xi Jinping's remit and idea, raising the profile of the Ministry of Environmental Protection giving them increasing power. Beijing's actually improved in terms of air quality. There's been like uh, you know, over 40,000 factories that have been inspected over the last six months or so. Uh, they did a massive program of converting from coal to natural gas in the surrounding provinces. In fact, they had to back off on that a little bit because they had a gas supply problem and people in the wintertime were suffering because of the lack of of heat. So there's a seriousness of purpose now um, in the country, which recognizes that this transformation in terms of managing fossil fuels is got a real political context for the government right now, and that's delivering on air quality. On the carbon and climate side, the thing that it's done is a lot what the Belt and Road is about. China is no longer viewed as a pariah nation internationally. What do we hear? Ah, China is a climate leader. What's the matter with you, Donald? <laughs> right? Um, so they've got a lot of, have a lot of cred now from the things that they've done uh, on, on climate. So they really are a, you know, a full-fledged member of the global community, no longer 
an outlier. And to India, yes, the entry strategy is air quality, then carbon. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a very good talk. So you also mentioned that China spent most of their effort in the last century trying to feed in their people. And uh, you also mentioned that you did a lot of your work in China in rural areas. So I would appreciate if you can elaborate more about your point about the conflict between feeding people and, uh, and the emission reduction. Because I guess that when you're talking to a lot of Chinese people, their priority, especially in rural areas, is to for feeding their people instead of you know, reduce the emission, which might harmonize you know, uh, you know, might be harmful to their, you know, you know, agriculture production. So I would appreciate if you can uh, elaborate more on that point. Thanks. How am I? Um, that's a complicated question because, you know, I, it's always challenging to think about a country as, you know, of 1.3 billion people with its diversity and scale and characterize it in some, you know, me, you know meaningful, meaningful way. Um, there is an increasing recognition about the impact of um, uh, air emissions on agricultural productivity um, uh, in China. Uh, China is losing its uh, arable land as it uh, urbanizes. Uh, it has a national red line on arable land. Uh, it has a an uh, idea about national self-sufficiency in terms of agricultural production, which limits its participation in um, it is very much a, uh, I think, uh, a, a challenge for China. Uh, it doesn't have property rights. It's increased the length of tenure on the part of farmers in terms of ownership and management of land. A lot of the available farm labor is, of course, migrates to cities to work in factories to send remittances back home. There's an interest in mechanization now to follow some of what the um, pattern has been in other developed nations in terms of the agricultural sector, that itself will have its own set of problems in terms of productivity, et cetera. So, and I find still that the agricultural sector um, is neglected in relation to a focus and intention on the part of the government. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much.